Hello, I'm Peter Baxter, Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. It's my pleasure to introduce this podcast. In it, we'll be discussing the paper, Proportion of Life Lived with Dystonia Inversely Correlates with Response to Paladal Deep Brain Stimulation in Both Primary and Secondary Childhood Dystonia by Lumsden et al., which is in the June 2013 issue of the journal. It will be discussed by Dr. Daniel Lumsden of the Complex Motor Disorders Service, Evelina Children's Hospital, Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust, London, UK, who is one of the authors, and Dr. Elegas Montbalieu, Department of Rehabilitation Sciences, Catholic University, Leuven, Belgium, who has also written a commentary on the article. Please can we start with you, Dan, to outline the paper and its background? Absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work. So really this paper represents a summation of some of our outcome data from our cohort of children who between the Avelina Children's Hospital and the Functional Neurosurgery team at King's College Hospital have undergone DBS in the last few years. And really the service started in around 2005 um, and we included patients who'd undergone DBS up until around 2011. So this was a retrospective study. All of the data was collected during our routine clinical practice. And over that time period, there were 70 children who had undergone DBS surgery. Now, we excluded two children from this analysis as they'd had unilateral DBS for hemidystonia. And then there were five children who were excluded from the final uh, analysis of the, of the outcome data as they'd had infection and uh, that had necessitated removal of part of their uh, DBS equipment. So really our intentions with this uh, piece of work were to look at our outcomes in terms of changes in Burke van Morrison dystonia rating scale, which is a criterion reference scale for, for measuring the severity of dystonia. And what we were particularly interested in was to see if we could identify factors that related to that outcome and, and perhaps will give us some prognostic information. Uh, so we had rather a mixed cohort. There were um, 17 children who met a criteria for primary dystonia as their etiological classification. There were uh, 28 children who had what we defined as a secondary static dystonia, by which we meant a uh, dystonia due to a static non-progressive brain lesion. There were five children who had a progressive dystonia uh, due to kind of a, a miscellaneous heterogeneous group of conditions. And then we took out as a separate group the 13 children who had neuronal degeneration with brain ion accumulation. And our reason for taking them out as a group were there are a subset of children and uh, young people who've had quite a bit of data published on them. And we thought it would be of particular interest to various groups around the world to, to see that data in isolation. Now, really, what we demonstrated was, as is consistent with previous studies, in general, the group with primary dystonia had a good improvement in their book for Morrison dystonia rating scales at the six and one year uh, at time points after the surgery whereas there was a, a smaller, more modest improvement seen in those children with the um, secondary dystonia. Now, there is quite an interest in the literature looking at how the duration of a child's dystonia or a young person's dystonia affects their, or their outcome after DBS. And there's a number of groups that have, in particular with the primary dystonia, has demonstrated that there's a correlation between the length of dystonia uh, and the improvement in symptoms. And, and that's a negative correlation. So the longer that people have their dystonia, the more, more reduced their response becomes. Now, what we were actually interested in is not just looking at the length of time that children had dystonia, uh, but, but had the proportion of their life that, that was lived with dystonia. And our hypothesis was that it wasn't just the, the length of time that you had your dystonia, which would affect your ability to respond to the DBS, but also the uh, proportion of your life. And really, we were thinking that the earlier your onset of your dystonia and the longer uh, as a proportion of your life you'd had the dystonia, the more reduced that your response to DBS was uh, become. Uh, and really what we found was that just in some simple statistical analysis, there was a correlation between that proportion of life lived and the response to DBS, a negative correlation as we've hypothesized. And that was something which had not been looked at by other groups. And really, that's a brief outline of our findings from this paper. So, indeed, currently, there is an increasing attention being paid to the brain stimulation, not only for primary dystonia, but also for secondary dystonia. I think that's a very good thing. But you also know from previous studies that DPS is reducing primary dystonia very well, but in secondary dystonia, its application has not been fully investigated. And, there is an and, the results of DBS in secondary dystonia are less spectacular. 
compared with primary dystonia. There are several good things of this study, and the unique contribution of the study by uh, Dr. Lumsden and his team is the fact, actually, that they compared the effectivity of BBS within different etiological groups, and therefore they have used uniform methodology. And the second thing is, the second unique contribution, is a search for prognostic or predictive factors, such as the proportion of life lived with dystonia. And this is actually new in the literature and may yield an important message connected to the timing of this particular intervention. But I have a question for Dr. Lumsden. What is your experience with, for example, such a young age? Because you recommended in your study to start with DBS within five years of onset. Uh, and of course, goals and expectations must be realistic. But what is your experience with a very young age, for example, for, for secondary dystonias? So I think the, the timing of the um, surgery for DBS has traditionally been limited by the hardware that's been available. The initial devices that were implanted were rather large devices, uh, quite physically uh, voluminous, um, and there was a limit to the size of the child that could physically ha have one of those devices inserted in, uh, potentially into the subclavicular fossa or into the abdomen. And in fact, the original devices, you needed a separate unit for each side of the mm -hmm. brain there. In the last few years, um, there's been the introduction of the rechargeable devices, and we use the Activa RC device um, in, in the last few years as a kind of primary implant. And that's really meant that now we feel that it's possible for us to stimulate children from around 12 kilograms in size. Our experience with the uh, younger children is slightly reduced compared to our experience of, sort of across childhood as a total there. And really those children that we have operated on very early have been the secondary dystonia, in particular those with dystonia relating to a prematurity um, or a hypoxic ischemic delivery. In terms of the outcomes for those groups there, well, really, they are the group that have had the onset of their dystonia very, very early on, and in particular, their children who really have not had a, a period of normal motor development. And in terms of their a, a improvement on the book from Marsden scale, um, they've often had minimal, if any, improvement there. And that really would be in keeping with the, the hypothesis we've put forward in this paper about the, uh, the influence of the proportion of your life there. I think you raise a very interesting and very important point about the idea of goal setting and expectations from these kind of uh, interventions. And I think it's very easy for parents and, and perhaps clinicians to see the videotapes, which are even now on YouTube, of, of children having very dramatic responses with primary dystonia. The children with very severe abnormal movements who are able to, to get up from their wheelchairs and, and walk and be much more independent afterwards. And I think really one of the things that we are constantly trying to work towards is setting reasonable expectations and reasonable goals for, for what the functional outcomes of these interventions are going to be for, for young people and children. And I think that's particularly important when you're moving forward to newer groups, be that different age groups or different disease conditions. It's trying to be as open and as honest and uh, as, as realistic with which parents as, as you can be. I think if you set an unrealistic goal or, or if the parents have set unrealistic goals, even mm -hmm. if there are real gains that are materialised after any kind of intervention, then I think you, you will, will find that your patients and your, your children are, not, are going to be dissatisfied by the outcome there. When I, when, when I see the results of your study and you take a closer look to the results, then the question raises about the difference between the primary dystonia and the secondary dystonia. So your results really confirms that primary dystonia has the best response to DBS, and secondary dystonia also has the potential to respond to DBS, but actually to a lesser extent. And this difference raised the question, why? Why is there a different effect of DBS within the different ecological groups? And certainly, of the extent of brain lesions in secondary dystonia may be a crucial role, but still the question is there, why is there such a large difference between the primary dystonia and the secondary dystonia? What, what's your opinion about that? Well, I think even when you're talking about classification of dystonia, it's something which I think is, is very often debated. 
And we talk about primary dystonia as being classified as an etiology in which the abnormal movements are the only sign of neurological abnormality on the background of normal neuroimaging. Um, and, and these are obviously thought to be the primary genetic conditions. You know, the mm. dystonia, with DYT1 being the kind of obvious example of that. We talk about secondary dystonias as being a sort of acquired disorders, if you like, or disorders where dystonia arises as a symptom of some identified causal factor affecting the brain. But what really I wonder is it, whether it's appropriate to look at it in that kind of binary way, or whether actually there's more of a continuum between those two. The early descriptions of primary dystonia were when people were talking about normal neuroimaging, or well, structural normal MR imaging, but we're increasingly becoming uh, aware from some more uh, technical neuroimaging approaches, the voxel-based morphometry looking at gray matter abnormalities, the various techniques for looking at the metrics from diffusion weighted imaging, that there are actually differences from normal controls to uh, subjects who have primary dystonias there. And um, even if you look at our cohort and other cohorts, within that group that we termed primary dystonia, there is actually a range of responses. And for some people, there were, were, were very minimal improvements in their Bert von Marsden dystonia rating scale. So I think really when we talk about dystonia as being primary and being secondary, I think increasingly as our understanding of the genetics and our, and our neuroimaging and electrophysiology techniques as well actually improve, I think we're going to see a blurring of those and we're going to look more from rigid kind of categories to classify patients more into this spectrum of disorders. In terms of why there's a difference in response, I think that's very much multifactorial. I think mm. that there are structural lesions to the brain, both the gray and the white matter, which I think are likely to limit the responsiveness to DBS. It, it's easy to think of DBS as an electrode having a point effect within a, a nucleus in the brain there. And people originally sort of talked about it in terms of it being a functional lesion, if you like. I think what's very obvious as experience has grown with particularly the primary dystonias, we see that uh, the full effect of, of a change to the stimulation parameters, for example, can take several weeks to become apparent there. And I think what's clear is that it's having a more broad, widespread effect on uh, the distributed motor network, and certainly one in the context of primary dystonia has abnormalities in its plasticity. So I think if you have a damage to the actual target that the electrode is going into, there'll be an effect on how effective it is there. I think if there's damage to your white matter connectivity, I think that, again, is going to affect how things are perpetuate. And also, of course, we've got this data in this paper looking at the proportion of the life lived. Certainly within the childhood group, those children who have secondary dystonias are likely to have very early onset, if not onset at birth or from a premature birth. Whereas those children who have a primary dystonia, typically it's later on in uh, the first decade or the early second decade of life that they'll get an onset of their dystonia. So I think there's those multifactorial reasons why we get that difference in responsiveness there. Obviously, I think uh, further research uh, into this topic is, is necessary. But also, I think its relation with the clinical presentation. Uh, the clinical characteristics of dystonia in these groups. I think it's recommended that, that, that to understand this better. I, I think greater insight is needed into the different characteristics of dystonia in order to be able to better delineate therapy interventions or, or to, to, to go to better targeted interventions. But actually, do we know if the characteristics of primary dystonia or, or secondary dystonia differ. More specifically, which characteristics of dystonia are influenced by DBS? And, and I will make myself clear, because with the recommendations of the task force on childhood mo uh, movement disorders, they, they recommended to assess clinical characteristics of dystonia at rest during activity or associated with uh, specific tasks. But actually, when you use the Burke Farm Motion Dystonia Rating Scale, I think the sensitivity of uh, this scale is not enough to capture these clinical characteristics. So I think further research is, is recommended um, with assessments to capture uh, the several aspects of dystonia. What is your opinion about that? <laughs> 
Uh, I think they're all very excellent points there, and, and there's actually some, several sort of separate issues there. Uh, to, to address the first point about whether dystonia in the context of a primary dystonia is the same as the secondary dystonia, I think there's two issues there. First is the issue of whether the dystonic movements look the same, and the second is the context in which they're occurring. Now, in, in terms of whether they look the same, I'm aware of work that's been performed by Professor Jonathan Mink across in, in America, where they have performed some kinematic analysis of the abnormal movements, both in uh, different etiological causes of dystonia, uh, acetosis and chorea and the like. I've seen that presented, but I'm not sure whether it's in print yet, but that actually seems to suggest that actually there are common uh, kinematic uh, elements to, to dystonia, uh, regardless of the cause. And so really that would suggest that the primary dystonia looks like the same on those kinematic measures as the secondary dystonias, regardless of whether it's been caused by a preterm birth or a, a, an injury affecting the brain later on in life, a vascular insult and the like there. I think what's important, a distinction in terms of the multi-phenotype between what we kind of classically consider primary and secondary dystonia, is that in the secondary dystonia groups, there are often coincidence other abnormal movements. And so we talk about dystonia choreoacetosis in, in the context of a child with cerebral palsy. We often see, obviously, that combination of movements there. And I think, obviously, that there are distinct elements of dystonia, there's distinct elements of chorea, there's distinct elements of aphetosis in those young children. I suppose the question is, how can we measure them? How can we differentiate them reliably? And mm -hmm. how can we look at what our interventions are, are doing to them? And then the next question I would suggest is, it, what's the impact of that? So if we have a child with a mixed movement uh, disorder phenotype, uh, you know, are we just from an intervention like DBS or ITB or a medication, are we just reducing one element of it? And that's an important thing, I think, for us to know because it may be that there are different interventions to target against the different aspects of their movement disorder. But then with all of these things where we have an impairment scale and we're just looking at the severity of the abnormal movements, the question is how that then translates into any functional gains for the child or, or the young person. And really, if an intervention removes all of the abnormal movements, but there's no practical gains to the family and uh, their carers or the child and their carers in terms of um, functional improvement and what that child can do for themselves or how care can be delivered to them, then, then I think that's an important thing for us to be aware of and, and an important consideration when we're looking at any kind of interventional studies for the future. Well, you've pointed cerebral palsy and the simultaneous presence of dystonia and choreacetosis. And actually, yes, that's a very good point you have there. Recently, we developed a new scale, and you already know that the dyskinesia impairment scale specifically for the measurement of secondary dystonia and choreacetosis in the dyskinetic cerebral palsy. But I think it's important to measure them both in a clinical way, in a clinical evaluation way, but also, I think the, the, the possibilities with uh, kinematics, I think that's a good step forward because it gives us a better uh, obvious view of the clinical characteristics. But it's it's a first step. And recently there was the KDM, I think, of um, Anne Calamura, recently published in 2012, and they have measured overflow movements mm. uh, of dystonia in a mixed group, primary and secondary Estonia, I think that's a good step forward. Uh, but at the same time, you also have the characteristics of dystonia and choreacetosis simultaneously present in secondary Estonia. And you have to, you, you, you must discriminate them. These are two different movement disorders, but they are mostly simultaneously present. And therefore, I think it's necessary to use measurements or assessments that differentiate these uh, movement disorders uh, and measures the clinical characteristics in the same scale construct. So I think it's a, kinematics are a good step forward, but I think it's a first step that's uh, it's very preliminary, I think, isn't it? You, you mentioned uh, Jonathan Mink. Uh, I think it's, it's very preliminary, but I think it's a good step forward. Um, at present, at now, at, there is insufficient knowledge about the clinical presentation or relationship, and, and for sure, uh, further research is, is necessary to 
uh, differentiate the presence of dystonia and phobiocytosis during action, addressed between duration and amplitude, the several aspects that uh, dystonia and phobiocytosis are present in, in, in the suffering dystonia or in cerebral palsy, which, by the way, is the largest group in uh, childhood dystonia. So I think we have a lot of work to do for future research. <laughs> Um, because a, a lot of things are, are lacking in our knowledge, and think that that that's a challenge for the future. I, I would absolutely agree. And one of the one of the challenges we have, I think, in pediatrics is the heterogeneity of the children that, that we're seeing. Now, obviously, our cohort we started to collect the data back in 2005 when when tools like your dyskinesia impairment scale obviously weren't available. And I think what was quite striking, I think the dyskinesia impairment scale is a really important step forward for how we're looking at these kind of movement disorders in children. But what I think was very interesting from your publication and when you introduced the scale was you looked at kind of one of the ways of validating it was by comparing the, the results of the score with the Barry Albright dystonia rating scale and, and the BFM DRS scale, and I think the UDRS scale for the dystonic element there. But there wasn't a, a an equivalent scale that you could compare the choreophotoid movements to. So it is a very, I think, new development that we're, we're looking at the movements in eight separate ways there. But I think you're absolutely right. What, what's increasingly important is our awareness of the motor phenotype and really having good clinical descriptions of, of the children's movements, but also really understanding how those abnormal movements interfere with, with daily functioning and quality of life and aspects yeah. like that. It's interesting. I, I think one of the things that, uh, that interests me about the kinematic side of it is nowadays so many people have the, the Xbox Connect type technology in their house where they have a, a sensor that can look at their movements and translate it onto something moving on a computer screen there. So you think if we can put those in so many homes, you think that mm -hmm. we would be able to develop the technology to, to look at our movements in an objective fashion there. I think one of the difficulties with any kind of scale is whilst they're criteria and reference and, and you aim for objectivity, there still is a subjective element to it. There still is that judgment call of what a part of the movement is dystonia, what part of the movement is chorea, what part of the movement is apoptosis. And I think that there are elements of uh, abnormal movement when we see it in a child or a young person where we can clearly see, well, well that's dystonia, that, that's apoptosis, etc., etc. But I think there is often a little bit of a blurring around the edges where it can be difficult to, to differentiate. And I'm sure we've all sat with our colleagues and, and looked at video recordings and had sort of heated debates and discussion over what element of their movement we would describe as what. I think it's, it's very important that we all use the same definitions and, and discrimination between dystonias. For example, at this moment there are two consensus dystonia definitions used by experts, one from the task force on childhood motor movement disorders and one from the servants of cerebral palsy in Europe. But actually it's a, it's a reasserting thought that they, these definitions are quite the same. But a good knowledge of these operational definitions is really crucial boring and judging dystonia, and particularly when discriminating between secondary dystonia and phoreatosis and cerebral palsy. I think that that's an important take-home message, that the, the knowledge of the operational definition is really important to discriminate the movement disorders. And the scale we have developed, the dyskinesia impairment scale, is an evaluation scale, but it's not a discrimination scale. So it's actually based on the operational definitions. And therefore, it's, it's really important that raises are experienced in discriminating between uh, dystonia and choreotitis and or other uh, movement disorders. So I think that's a really important thing. No, absolutely. And I think that a commonality of our operational definitions and our nomenclature it is so important. With all of these disorders in childhood, we're talking single centers doing still relatively small numbers. And I think if we were to move forward yeah. to address the important questions, which to my mind the real important questions for DBS are, well, who should we be performing the surgery on and, and when should we be doing it? And what should we be counseling the children and their families as the likely outcomes? To be able to answer those questions prospectively, we're going to have to be doing large multi-center studies likely across a number of countries. And, and it's very important that we are all talking about the same thing when we talk about dystonia and when we talk about aphetosis and the like there.
But I think it's reassuring that there is a real interest in people sort of getting together and talking about these things and <laughs> and sharing their ideas. <laughs> I think it is, it is, uh, it's reassuring to see that. Absolutely. In terms of the dyskinesia impairment scale and moving yeah. forward, I've seen obviously the original publication and the uh, work looking at, I think, slightly less expert writers for it there. Where do you see as the way forward for, for that scale? And where do you see it as the as, as the way to start applying it? And how would you like to see it applied? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a clinical scale, and you have to use it in a clinical way. You have to use it, one, for a clinical decision maker, and secondly, you can use it for a scientific research. Because the the construct of the scale just gives us the possibility to discriminate the stone and charitotosis specifically for cerebral palsy. But for primary dystonia, uh, further research is necessary to know if the dyskinesia impairment scale has a good reliability and validity uh, for, for primary dystonia. So I think that's a, a topic for future research. But the dyskinesia impairment scale is, is, is really developed for cl- clinical use but also, at the same time, to increase our insights in the clinical characteristics, like duration, like amplitude, like the presence of hysteria and charitosis during activity, during voluntary movements, but also at rest. And from, from our opinion, it can give us a lot of information in the natural history. And, of course, further research longitudinal studies are necessary, and also with a, a larger group. But um, therefore, multi-center studies uh, would be a very good thing to uh, to reach that uh, goal. If we go back to our earlier discussions about the uh, trying to work out why there's differences in responses between the primaries and the secondary Estonians, and, and uh, my sort of feeling that, that perhaps we should be looking at the continuum, I think one of the real benefits of a scale like the dyskinesia impairment scale where you're, you're measuring the dystonic elements and the choreophotoid elements at the same time is that that's potentially a single scale which could be applied to different populations with you know the pure primary dystonia and then the mixed movement disorders in the secondary case there. And that will be one tool which we would be able then to compare response across the groups because obviously it's very difficult if we have two or three different subsets of patients or young people where we're then applying different measures to, to look at the severity of their abnormal movements and then trying to make comparisons across the groups. So I think mm-hmm. it's a really uh, important thing for us to be exploring the applicability of that scale outside of the, of the sort of cerebral palsy domain. So I think in summary, I think deep brain stimulation is a very promising intervention for treatment of dystonia of all different etiologies. I think it's quite clear that there is a good body of evidence to support its use in patients and people with primary dystonia, but I think there's increasing evidence to support its use in, in the pediatric age group. And I think it's our feeling that what we should be trying to offer the intervention as soon as we can after the onset of the abnormal movements, as I think there's a good weight of evidence now to suggest that that's where we're going to get the, the best outcomes. The challenge is really to look at those children and young people with the secondary dystonias, and as we've discussed, the, the, the mixed movement phenotypes, and really trying to identify which of those children are the appropriate candidates for surgery and what measures we can get from electrophysiology, from clinical characteristics, and from near further neuroimaging work to try and understand better the differences in responsiveness across the groups there, and really to look to see is there a, a difference in the timing of the intervention. The question, of course, is whether a portion of your life lived with dystonia, whether the main determinant of that is actually the, the timing of the onset. And obviously, if there's an onset in at a delivery or a due to a premature birth there, it's difficult, obviously, to, to kind of make any kind of intervention to that, that timing there. But really, the question would be whether earlier intervention in that secondary dystonia group it is beneficial. I think it's essential that to move forward, it's prospective multi-centre work that is performed to look at that. And I think we have to have a commonality of the terminology we're using around the abnormal movements. We have to have a reliable scale that we can use to measure them. And I think we also need to have a measure of outcome which is looking at the functional benefits or the quality of life benefits to to young people. Because I think that's really the important issue for parents and, and children and their carers. And really that's the information we need to, as clinicians to be able to best advise the, the young people that we're coming into contact with.
Well, I think it's it's a very good conclusion that uh, Dr. Lumsden ha- ha- has given. Uh, the take-home message from my point of view is, is that we actually really need further insights in the clinical characteristics of the several uh, dystonia etiology groups, and uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, there. So uh, it's it's very interesting to discuss this, and it will be very interesting to discuss it with uh, other people of uh, expert centers. So I think it's it's a very good thing that this patient group is in, in picture. It has a large impact on, on the quality of life and participation and activities. So I think this patient group deserves uh, more research for the future. We've now come to the end of our podcast. Many thanks indeed to Dr. Daniel Lumsden and Dr. Elegas Monbalu for a very instructive podcast on a complex topic but which touches on some of the fundamentals of clinical neurology. I hope everyone has got as much out of this as I have. It certainly helps put the article into context and just remind listeners that the article is Proportion of Life Lived with Dystonia Inversely Correlates with Response to Palatal Deep Vein Stimulation in Both Primary and Secondary Childhood Dystonia. It's by Lumsden et al. in the June 2013 issue.